Well, thank you all so much for coming to this super important brain club. Um, and there are a couple people I don't know yet, so I will introduce myself. I'm Mel Hauser, I use she, they pronouns, and I am executive director at All Brains Belong Vermont. And um, this is Brain Club. Brain Club is our weekly community education uh, series where we talk about everyday life brain topics, um, where we can bring together community to reimagine our big systems this month. That's what our theme is, um, where we, um, it's very tempting when we think about the major structures of society that aren't working. And I think that in COVID era, this has forced a lot of people to zoom out and say, you know, hey, this not working. Um, and whether that be in, in healthcare, education, employment, the, our family systems and culture, um, we don't have to be stuck in that way. Um, and so um, I, am, I am thrilled to be joined by a panel of educators today um, to, to be continuing this conversation about what is possible um, within the education system. And <laughs> brain. Try to make my life easier by printing things for me. I have the kind of brain that works best with visual supports, but that's all right. Um, I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is actually, maybe what I'll do is spotlight our panelists, all of them, and introduce. Okay, add a spotlight. Okay, and then one of our panelists is 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 participating asynchronously, so so uh, not. Not, not available to be to be spotlit, but we will still bright spot. Um, okay, so um, uh, maybe 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 wave as I as I as I talk about you, and then and then and then we can go from there. Uh, so Mitch Polly is a special educator from the Montpelier area, um, with uh, twenty years in the education system, and is now is going to tell us about his journey in um, trying to affect change within the education system. Right. And, uh, and then maybe and 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 so maybe maybe what I'll do is I'll introduce uh, maybe maybe yeah I will introduce one at a time oh yeah the come as you are rule Sarah thank you oh my goodness that was the point of making slides after all my goodness brain poor brain all right so that's why we have a team we have a culture of interdependence here and I'm supposed to turn on the captions. There we go. Thank you, Sarah, that was super helpful. All right, all forms of participation are okay here. Um, you can have, I, like you, you, you have figured this out already, but you can have your video on or off. We don't expect you to look at the camera. We don't expect you to sit still. We really want you to just come as you are. Fidget, stim, take breaks, eat, you know, kids, pets, stuffies, anything goes. You can communicate however is comfortable. You can unmute and speak. You can type in the chat box, gesture, use emoticons, whatever, whatever works for you. And safety is really important to us here um, at All Brains Belong. And we affirm all aspects of identity and um, in order to respect and protect one another's access needs. If there's gonna be any, any topic that is potentially distressing um, to others, we just ask that you give us a heads up with a content warning. And what I will do after the topic is complete is that I will say something in the chat to let you know that the topic is over. Um, and so feel free to turn off your sound or leave the room and come on back. Um, speaking of access needs, to if you would like closed captioning and it's not popping up automatically, or if you're having it pop up automatically and you don't want it there, um, either click the live transcript CC or the more dot, 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 and choose either show subtitles or hide subtitles. Um, and looks like the, the All Brains Belong team is, is, uh, is, is saying hello. So uh, Sarah Wilkins is here and Sierra Miller, thank you both for being here. Okay, so now, now I will go back to Introducing our, I'll introduce our whole panel and then you guys can decide what order in which you want to speak. Um, all right, so um, welcome Mitch and welcome Anna. So Anna is a 
mom, early educator and advocate who has spent the last 20 plus years doing everything from teaching, researching, homeschooling, experimenting, and all the things. Um, and um, through this journey, he's also raised two awesome kids who are now adults, practically adults, um, and, um, and is going to share with us um, the, the, the journey both as an educator in the classroom and in uh, supporting children, um, her own children. Um, and 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 share share her experiences with us. We are also joined by Vicky Senny, Cecilia Puglio, and Katrina Ellis Ferrara, who are early educators from the nature-based Turtle Island Children's Center in Montpelier. And we are also um, uh, asynchronously joined by Missy Axelrod, um, who is the director of uh, Vermont Farm and Forest School in Roxbury, Vermont, um, who has 20 years of experience as an educator and in working in sustainable food systems and farming, um, which she now weaves together with education um, in, in an independent school setting that is both hybrid indoors and outdoors. So, um, who wants to go first? Um, I can. Amazing, thank you, Mitch. All right, cool. Um, okay, well, hi everyone. Uh, just, <clears throat> I'm not sure what mode it is on Zoom, but I am on a phone, which I've never really done before. I'm used to computer, so I can't really see anybody if anybody is up on the screen um but hello to all of you um so my name is mitch polly um i live in plainfield um uh and i have been in the field of public education for about 20 years now in various different modes um i've been a behavior interventionist uh i've been a paraeducator um and for the last 15 years or so, a special educator. Um, and especially in the state of Vermont, I have worked in several districts, most recently Washington Central Supervisory Union, um, and am since transitioning out to go to Maple Hill School and Farm, which is just right down the road from me, um, which I'm really psyched about. Um, and in my course of doing this work, especially within the last few years, um, I have seen the need for tremendous change, which I know that we all have. Um, but you know, in the last couple of years of COVID um, in the public educator realm, it was one of those things that happened that blew the roof off the place and really exposed a lot of the issues that we've also known have been going on forever, but it really just shed light on what, um, what we need to look at and what we need to change and reevaluate, um, especially in the areas of equity um, and belonging uh, and all of these things that just, again, under the surface have always been there, but I think just like blew the roof off of it, right? And so um, I was really hopeful, uh, maybe some rose colored glasses, I guess, that this experience that we all went through would finally be the aha and we could say, wow, Here's our chance. We've been given this opportunity. Let's move. We can, we, we see what we need to do. We have the money to be able to do it. We have the resources, relatively speaking, you know, but we, we have it within us to do this. And being a special educator and having a really intensive caseload and seeing the needs of my kids pop up more and more and more and how especially sixth, seventh and eighth graders, I work in middle school, um, this this COVID generation, like seeing what really happened with them, um, it was real. And the needs that they have were real. And this is just an unprecedented thing. And, you know, I finally decided to really speak up and say stuff um, and bring it to the admin and bring it to these places that are really important to bring and hold the conversations. And what I found is that I was running up against a system that's over 100 plus years old and major conditioning. And the more I spoke up, the more I advocated, the more I got pushed out. Um, uh, and it became increasingly frustrating. And that's when I decided to be like, okay, in order for me to break out of the system and to think about something differently, I need to get out, I need to have an opportunity um, to be able to practice these skills, to develop my own social emotional awareness, to, to further develop my trauma informed approach, and to be able to go out and 
do the work to recognize um, what I will call my philosophy is the whole child. What I was advocating for in the public education system is that now we see that children are showing up as them whole selves and that's how we need to see them. They're no longer just in a box of one particular thing. They are showing up authentically as themselves in this moment in time. And we need to be able to, to welcome each child into this, this world of education, this thing, to be able to see them as a whole, to be able to really fully affect change, not only within them, but within ourselves and within the system. Um, and so it is my hope to, um, now that I'm going to be in more of a nature-based kind of education system, utilizing trade skills and bringing in all of these things that um, every child I wish could be able to utilize, um, whether it be a trade skill, whether it be a farm skill, whatever it is to just fit their mold of learning um, so that I can hopefully get the practice and feel to be able to coach districts in the future to be able to do this work. Um, so my work and my philosophy really is about seeing a whole child, welcoming the whole child and um, meeting them the where they're at basically. And how can I eventually, like I just said, take that work with meeting that kid where they're at, but also be able to teach and coach and help districts as a whole be able to see that we can actually do this and welcome kids as whole and so that we don't have to fit everybody in the same box thank you so very much i'm literally crying i'm just like so moved um yes i have so many questions and so many things to say and i think maybe what we'll do is um i'll i'll, I'll let all the other panelists do their thing. And then I think that, you know, taking, taking crowd, uh, you know, uh, comments and questions um, for, for, for all of you from all of us, uh, because like, I, 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 I could chase all the rabbit holes of everything you said for like hours, but I do want to share with you. And by the way, on your zoom, if you swipe right, you can see the gallery of people and you might see the chat. So in the chat, um, comments are, that's beautiful. And that was awesome to hear and gives me so much hope as a parent. Thank you. Oh, amazing. Um, Anna, you wanna go next? Yes, right, yeah. I, was, I was thinking that I would love to go after Mitch. That was so inspiring. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so as Mel said in my intro, I am, I'm a mom um, and and an educator, and I have um, I've I've really chosen to walk a path that's pretty unconventional in the way that I support my kids <laughs> by actually um, a similar kind of whole child approach, just seeing my kids as um, important members of our family and our community who have. Uh, a lot of value and really, really important um, skills to share. And so the thing that I wanna highlight because it's kind of what we're facing right now as a family the, at the most is, um, is this aspect that I find in education that um, this kind of old story that we're told that we have to work on what we're not good at, that the focus should be what is hard for you, do more of that and get better at that. Like this idea that we have to be sort of like um, across the board, sort of decent at everything. <laughs> um, and we've really, um, we really like pulled that concept apart in our family and, and really um, taken an approach where we look at what are you good at? What do you love? What's really easy for you? Um, and taking an approach that, that then that's, that's your gift and those are your skills and those are the amazing things that you have to offer the family because you know what? You're the only one in the family who finds that easy and <laughs> who's really good at that thing. Um, and so this year, I have a 16 year old who's will be starting uh, junior year in high school. And we have decided to kind of um, pull apart her um, course load this year to really allow her the energy time um, and, um, you know, 
privilege really to focus on what she loves and what she's passionate about so that she can feel really prepared to go into the world with this skill set that um that she's really passionate about and um and what that looks like for us, our family is we have enrolled her in vermont's home study program um but she can still enroll in classes at the public school so at the public school this year she we allowed her to choose the classes that she's really excited about um, through the school, which include uh, foreign language, uh, art classes, and um, some elective English and history classes. And then the subjects that she finds more difficult, we're going to take a real um, approach where we'll design the curriculum and find um, mentors and people in the community who can help her um, learn about things like science and math, some of the aspects that are not um, not necessarily her brain strength and not the things that she finds really intriguing and exciting and interesting. Um, and so we're going to find um, mentors that can help kind of bring math into the subjects uh, like art and um, writing and creativity um, so that she can learn, she still will learn those subjects, but through ways that really engage her and her creativity and her passions. Um, <clears throat> so that's just a little bit about how we're kind of flipping some of these brain rules about what is education. Um, and uh, yeah, I have so much to say about that, but it's been interesting to watch as um, some of the adults that I connect with um, are just like their minds are blown thinking about this, like, oh, I should do what is easy for me. And I'm like, yes, that's not easy for me. <laughs> like, that's easy for you. That's why we need you in our community doing that thing. Um, and so that's that's a that's something that right now is really exciting me is to support um, to support folks support families and and kids really find their way um, to you know and and a learning you know this innate learning um, within us that comes naturally and easily for us and um, so I'm I'm doing that and. Um, currently as a family coach, um, supporting families um, with being able to kind of customize and design the ways that they set up their, their community and their home um, to meet their child's needs in, in that way. Thank you so much, Anna. And um, I'm gonna, I'm, uh, it, it's requiring a lot of impulse control, but I'm gonna save my questions for you as well. <laughs> Let's hear from the Turtle Island team. You're on. All right, thank you. Does anybody wanna go first here? Vicki prepared a statement no, for I, you all. <laughs> I didn't prepare um, a statement, but at, you know, when this topic came up or Anna just said flipping the brain rules. And so I think that's, you know, what we're talking about here. And I was thinking of a time when um, a, a, that children have helped me to flip the brain rules that I grew up with. And um, when this was like 15, about 15 years ago, probably I was substitute teaching in a, in a school in inner city, Cleveland, Ohio. And it was my first time in the school and um, it was seventh grade. They had metal detectors at the door. Just before the class I was teaching started, it was a science class. Um, a child was um, sort of shoved to the ground by one of the police officers in the school because they thought that he had um, a knife on him. Um, and it, it, didn't, it didn't end up being true. Um, and so then children come into the classroom, they sit down and I have from the regular classroom teacher, a list of things that I'm supposed to do as the substitute. And it mainly consisted of you, you must read this chapter from your textbook and then fill out this workbook, your science workbook. So I insisted that the children in the classroom did that. That's how I, you know, that's how I learned in the public school that the teacher stands up there and tells you what to do and, and you, you do that thing. And it's usually sitting at your desk out of a book and a workbook. And nobody was listening to me and nobody was you know, paying attention to my words. And so I 
did something that is very hard for me to do. I raised my voice really loudly and I could feel it like in the depth of my belly. I like yelled at these kids, which is something that happened to me as a kid. That's how I learned, you know, um, and again, nobody really was phased by it. Nobody did anything. And it was a really, it was a really tough moment. And then everybody left and I realized, you know, I, I actually didn't go back to school for the next couple of weeks because I was just subbing so I could choose. Um, and I thought a lot about like, why, why, why did I do that? And especially why did I do that when I don't know what their lives are like? I don't even know who these kids are. And I yelled at them and I asked them to, to I, I was asking him to fill out this workbook that is not even relevant to what just happened in the hallway, for example. And so I did a lot of reading myself and I listened to some talks and I was trying to understand like, you know, how do we actually um, encourage a love of learning? Like, how do we actually in, um, just encourage kids to be kids? And so I, I ended up going back to school. It was the last day of school that year and I was in a fourth grade classroom. And I changed the approach a little bit. I um, told the kids what their teacher had left for, for me to instruct them to do. I said, you can do this in any order you want, in any way you want. You can do it by yourself or with other people. You can stand, you can sit, you could dance, you could do however you want. And all day, kids were you know, doing puzzles and then working on something. They were working together. They were working by themselves. They were doing cartwheels in between. There was a lot going on. And then some of them wrote stories and they shared their stories and some people listened, some people were not in a place to listen and that was okay. And then it was the end of the day and they were lined up at the door and it was the last day of school. And one, one child says, um, she says, Miss DB, how did we behave today? I said, you were excellent. She said, we've never been excellent before. I said, what do you mean? She said, usually the teacher comes in here and tells us to sit down and shut up. She said, we're kids, we're supposed to talk. And then the bell rang and everybody left. And I just stood there like thinking, what are, what are we doing um, to these kids? And I think almost immediately after I started um, the process of moving to Vermont, coming to grad school and studying social justice education and what that means. And, and something I can't get out of my head as I was listening to Mitch and Anna too, is um, the idea that that I've always been told that children are the future because I was also the class of 2000, which was like the millennium class. And so since I started kindergarten back in the day, they, they kept reminding us, oh, you are the class of 2000. And all I could think was, so not until then am I gonna be relevant in life. You know, so, so we keep saying children are the future yet they are here now. They, they can, you know, they, they can talk, they have, things to say or things to do and they are relevant and their and their lives are very relevant now and so I think that um you know kind of like Mitch was talking about the whole whole self or the whole child it's like that is the approach we want to take with children that children are here they're relevant the world impacts children and they they're impacted by it and we can't pretend that they're not and we shouldn't see ourselves as separate from them because just because we're grownups and their children, we are all human together and we're all learning together. And I think um, just narrowing that divide as much as possible is something that I'm thinking about. And I'll let Katrina and <coughs> Cecilia take it away. Um, thank you, Vicki, for that story. I, I wanna just sort of leave that, but to say another, just bring it back to our space at Turtle Island and being early childhood ed educators, all of what Vicki's saying is, constantly on our brain and not only is it a massive passion of ours to be with children but I think part of our work as well as we see flipping the brain flipping other people's brain thoughts what are our brain strengths really trying to come together as a community to work that out um, with with the children um, and making sure that we're advocating for that work um, and lifting the voices of the children as well because we might have similar thinking here on this on this zoom but there's a lot of folks who are maybe like Vicky in that first moment who still expect a certain way of schooling or learning because that's what how they have learned um and so I think 
a lot of the emphasis as well is, is how can we spread this, like Mitch is saying, moving past where he, his work has been to do more coaching and Anna's coaching as well, um, and just spreading that, that message and doing it together. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Katrina. Um, I'm a preschool teacher at Turtle Island. Um, and yeah, everything everyone has said so far is really inspiring. Um, another thing that I would like to bring up is that I really believe that like relationship with children is the foundation of all like good teaching mm -hmm. um, and giving teachers autonomy and freedom and power and, you know, to create those relationships of trust and security um, and love and nurturing, um, I think goes a long way. And I feel like I have that here and I'm very grateful for that. I just finished up my master's at UVM for early childhood special ed. And during that program, I was, um, did student teaching at a preschool in Burlington and, you know, saw the, the difference between public school and where I've been working now for the past five years and, um, you know, chose at the end of that program to stay at Turtle Island, um, even with pressure to not mm. do so, um, <laughs> just because of, you know, financial and, you know, that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, I'm excited to hear more thoughts about all of this and thanks for having me. Thanks so much. That in, in just in the in the chat, such a powerful story. Someone else. Seriously, I'm so inspired right now. Thank you so much for sharing your vulnerability with us. Um, and uh, just highlighting closing the gap on the divide between adults and children as much as possible. Wow. Thank you. I'm going to share a video um, from our last panelist, um, Nixie, Missy Axelrod from Vermont Farm and Forest School founder and director, um, which is an independent K through five school in Roxbury. Let me see if I can get this to work. Here we go. Hey everybody, I'm Missy Axelrod from the Vermont Farm and Forest School and Drift Farmstead. I'm the founder and director here, and we are a small independent school for kindergarten through fifth grade. We also offer homeschool programs and summer camps. And we also work with about a dozen public schools in central Vermont doing farm food nutrition education. Our society is made up of systems. Systems are such an important and natural way of life. I look at nature as the system and I try to mimic our day-to-day -day rhythms based on nature. That said, not all humans fit into the same systems and that includes education. My years of working in schools, I fully believe that all educators do the best that they can and love what they do and that's why they do it. Um, but that said, every place isn't for everyone and being able to have options for students that don't fit into a certain box is such an important way of mimicking nature. Nature gives us choices and I think education should give us choices too. And if we can provide different opportunities for our kids, they're going to be able to blossom in ways that we've never seen. And that's what we really try to encompass here at Vermont Farm and Forest School. Our school is not for everybody and other schools aren't for everybody. And being able to have the choice to fit into your most natural environment so that you can learn in the most natural way, I think is a gift that everybody should be given. And my goal as an educator and director of this program is to be able to just help foster that for families. This little statue behind me I always think of as myself at this time of the year as an educator and as a farmer drowning in the weeds. You know, I think we get caught up in wondering whether we're doing the right thing, um, offering the right type of curriculum for our kids. And if we can just slow down and let kids learn at their pace in their space that's comfortable for them, I really just think we'll be able to help them blossom as learners and be able to foster their curiosity and their interest. And that'll really help them grow into healthy adults that will bring sustainability to our communities, to themselves, and um, 
I think having choice at school is really, truly an important thing. So much here, so much. I wanna put our panel back, hold on. There's spotlight and spotlight and spotlight, okay. Um, what I'm gonna do, um, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Slow down. So um, uh, if anyone in the audience has any questions or comments um, for, for our panelists, feel free to keep using the chat and I will I will broadcast them or feel free to, to unmute. Whatever works for you. Otherwise, I have so many questions. <laughs> Go ahead, Laura. I always have questions. That was awesome. Thank you to all of the speakers. You guys are amazing. Um, so I have three kids and my oldest just turned five and I'm constantly struggling with where is the line between encouraging skill building and listening and validating where she is and meeting her with her strengths and um, kind of supporting her where she is. And it seems like you have all kind of found the magic recipe to, to balancing that any guidance for like the kid that, you know, they want to do something and then they sign up for it and you're kind of getting there and then they're kind of backing out and maybe less interest. Like, how do you get them to push themselves a little bit in ways that are supportive, but aren't forcing them into something that they don't want to do or feels uncomfortable? This is such an awesome question and um, something that is like a, you're constantly seeking that balance. I think as an adult who supports kids, like it's, um, it's, so it's something that is um, never going to be stagnant. Like you're never going to be like, ah, I did it. I figured it out. <laughs> right. Like it's a, it's like this constant work in progress and a, you're always kind of in the flow of that balance of, of offering a little bit more encouragement, um, you know, or, or um, taking that time to do that thing, slow down and build that trust. And sometimes um, it can take a lot longer than what our adult brains want to offer as a timeline, right? We're like, okay, you could have five minutes, in five minutes you have to make your decision. <laughs> And like, I actually said something to that extent the other day. I gave a timeline. I was okay, five minutes. Um, probably like five minutes we're gonna leave. And the 10 year old was like, You should never say that because as soon as you say five minutes, it's gonna be 30 minutes and then it's gonna be 40 minutes and you're gonna still be here talking. <laughs> I was like, oh, yep, you're right. <laughs> uh, so, you know, we, I think that's probably the hardest part is um, like our own expectations of like when it's supposed to happen. Um, and um, I have found that with, um, with, especially with kids that are a little bit more tentative, tend towards observation, um, that um the adult timeline um is often um like i think society in general values kind of that more extroverted approach of like just jumping right in um and so it's harder for us to recognize the value in children who um who do that like observation piece and who take a little bit longer to warm up to something <laughs> So just keep seeing the gift in that if you can. Um, we were just thinking a little bit about this too. And, um, you know, somebody, somebody said, slow down. I think Missy in her talk, she said, slow down. And that's always, I think for, for me, that's always a good reminder that I'm not sure why we're always hustling and bustling so fast and trying to, to do things so quickly. But um, I think the question that you asked might depend a little bit on the context too and what particular things your child is wanting to try out and then like we were just talking when you have those relationships and I as the mother you obviously have that relationship with the child um 
one thing we do a lot is we like narrowing that divide again we often tell stories of ourselves now or even as kids when we tried something that you know we were scared to do or um you know I was talking to a kid who was taking swimming lessons the other day and he's scared to go under and, and do the bubbles and make bubbles and so I was telling him about how I was feeling really scared to go off the diving board because I hadn't done it in a while. And so, re again, relating to children as humans. Um, mm -hmm. And you two have one. Yeah, I think that's, and <laughs> yeah, and it, you know, and I think, I think all of what Vicki said alludes to the fact that, as well that we have all of this all these notions in our brain of sort of what things are important to know and how you know them and how you learn them and maybe when you should learn them. And just to go back to the fact that I think as adults, we still have a lot of unlearning to do based on what we have built up in or been taught in our society um, and recognizing like if there if there's a resistance to something, maybe why, maybe figuring out more the depth of that. Are you nervous? Are you worried? Conversation and, and relationship, which might sound obvious, but I think it bears bears saying. Yeah, I was also thinking about thinking about like modeling. Um, I mean, I'm a preschool teacher at a nature based center. So that's my lens like and like Vicky said, it depends on the context. But for example, like if children are climbing like a new tree, like I'll go and climb the tree myself and like out loud be like, you know, I'm feeling a little bit nervous. Um, you know, and I, I'm a little bit scared or this might seem uncomfortable. And then afterwards, like share how I feel after I, you know, overcame those fears or whatever it is, you know, just empathizing with the child and narrating the emotional journey that goes into doing hard things that we can all do. And if I could add to that, um, that, you know, I, we've been talking, uh, a, a few of you have mentioned our construct of brain rules, like the things that we, we think are universal life truths, but like we really made them up or someone else made them up and we kind of grew up with them or internalized them. But it is actually a world rule that um, we need to feel safe before we can learn, right? We have to feel regulated before we can engage and purposefully communicate and all the things that is actually a world rule and so when kids feel unsafe it just is like only they get to decide that they are safe or not and so if there's resistance it may be because they don't feel safe and it might be there might be like i mean so 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 you know um there've been so many strategies shared for how you support perceived safety. Like, yeah, we should do that. That's, that, 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 that's always the answer. Um, but we don't get to just like, I, I, I remember as a kid growing up, just being told like, you know, suck it up. Oh, don't, you know, you're not, don't be scared. You're not scared. You're like, actually I am in fact scared. Like that's, that's how that is. Um, it is also, um, just to throw this out to, to all of the panelists, like one of the themes that I've heard from all of you is supporting student autonomy is really important. And, and I would say like directly impacts perceived safety. Um, and so, you know, being able to offer things in flexible multimodal ways of engagement and giving people freedom and choice to pick what works for them. It sounds like like you, you, you all do that. Like that is a strategy. So like what, what advice would you have um, for, 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 for educators and families who like, like things are offered in like a default way and they like wish that it could be in multiple different ways, but they feel kind of stuck. Like they don't, they don't have autonomy over teaching in the way that they think needs to be done. I can offer something. Um, <clears throat> this is exactly where I sit right now. And I realize that this is like, I, this is something I'm still as an educator who's transitioning out of public education, really trying to sit with. So I don't know if this is, is advice as much as it just is like, experience but I think 
for those who are maybe in this or, or like that are still in the public ed realm, one of the challenges that we come up with is even though that we want to see this child as the whole person and know that there's a modality that may work better for them and know absolutely we know all the brain science now that they need to be regulated before they can even learn. We know that. Um, the challenge is that we run up against a system that won't allow that still. And so we can have conversations with parents. We can have conversations with our teaching teams and our administrators. Um, and I really think the work lies in taking that step. If there is a, if there is a block to that, um, and I'm, I'm, I know that there are blocks. There are many blocks. There may be schools out there that, that really get this, like in the public ed realm. But I really do feel like the crux of the country is dealing with such a tough system in this way. And so I really think that it takes that leap from an educator to constantly keep going back and keep going back and keep going back to the team, to the administrators, to whatever, to really be able to say, this isn't working for this kid. And at which point there may be some flack for that, right? There may be some of the stuff coming down the pike from top down because you just need to do what you're told to do and it's too much work. And I, I really, it's just, I've sit in a position of like, it's, it's easy for me to say this now because I'm on the other side of it, but I was just two, three months ago, I was on the, the other side and <clears throat> advice I guess I would have is just to keep pushing. If you're getting a resistance, keep pushing. And it may be scary because you may get handed down something, but I really feel like that's where the change is going to happen, where we can start making those shifts for the kids and start having the modalities change. Because if we keep pushing and we keep pushing and we keep pushing, we just, we got to keep that energy moving forward. It's like everything else and every other justice movement, we just got to keep moving forward. And so that would be, I guess, my advice is from someone who just went through the shit <laughs> um, and had it all come down to me because I was really searching for those different modalities to be able to be offered and given and, and it wasn't happening. So I hope that makes sense to people out there, but that's what I would offer is that is as uncomfortable as it may be to be a teacher in the system and being like, I don't want to fight because I don't want to rock the boat or I don't know how to ask. Like we have to, this is the only way it's going to keep going. So that's what I just want to put out there. Thank you. And, 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 and the other thing is that um, when we ask kids. I think that's the key to the universe, right? Like these sweet little loves, like they know exactly what they want their education to look like. Um, like in our local district, um, uh, there's a, a, a group at the um, Main Street Middle School in Montpelier, a group of students who assessed the student body's goals for education last year. And they said they wanted more support for identity they wanted more autonomy over their curriculum and they wanted more project-based learning. It was very clear that's what they wanted. Um, and so, um, and, and, you know, in, in even, even when we launched All Brains Belong, um, you know, I, 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 uh, my, my, my then four-year-old is now five. My then four-year-old was like, mama, you should have, she, she doesn't have a Southern accent. I don't know why I just did that anyway, but <laughs> yeah, she says, mama, you should have a room where, kids just observe playing. You should have a room where kids play side by side. You should have a room where kids take turns and you should have a room where they play together. This way, whatever room you're in, you kind of know what's expected. That's a four-year-old telling you something really concrete about her access needs. Like, amazing. You just want ground rules. You just want to know what's expected. Like, that, that's a profound found wisdom or or I asked a, I asked a, a then eight-year-old on our uh, junior advisory council we have an, a junior, junior advisory council here at all brings belong kids who tell us exactly what they want their community to look like and this this then eight-year-old said because I asked hey um how do you make kids feel safe and what he said was I mean he like literally and it was like five seconds of thinking it's just like you let them do what they love. What? Yeah, you know, if you let me do what 
I love and you let that other kid do what they love and we just are both doing what we love, we're gonna feel safe. Mind blown. Like, really? Um, and, sh and, and actually that's in fact, um, our kid connections program. That's, that's what it comes from. It comes from that kid, eight year old who said, you just bring people together based on their shared interests and they form connection. And that's in fact, you know, what, what goes on. Um, but, 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 but that doesn't happen in the greater system, right? Like just it, so, so I guess what I want to throw out there is how do we on a, on a systematic level, how do we get collect and lift up the kids' voices? No, no. <laughs> it's a really good question, and I think it's a very hard question. Um, and I, somebody wrote that it's a recipe for burnout. You know, to keep to, to keep pushing and to to keep sort of pushing against the system that exists because we know what's right is to lift up the kids' voices. And we know that what's happening in a lot of spaces is not working for children. So the only the only thing I can say is um, that it's it's hard. Um, I think about this a lot because most of the children in our country are in public schools, and so it's not like we can throw you know just throw that idea out the window. And um, we need public schools, um, and so we can't do it alone. Is the only thing I want to say is like we need to find our people. That's what Cecilia actually said mm -hmm. a couple of minutes ago. We need to find our people. We need to do it together. And I've seen spaces um, here in Vermont, public school classrooms, where teachers have built an interdependent community in the classroom by what you were saying, Mel, like the kids are part of that community of decision makers in that classroom space. So you're still part of the system, of course, and you're up against a lot as a teacher and a lot of bureaucracy. But in that special sacred space, like, the kids also have um, a voice. Um, and I've seen teachers, I've seen a lot of teachers do this in their classroom space, but it's hard and I have seen people get burned out. And that's why we have to do it together and we have to come together as we are do doing right now. Um, because there's also joy in this struggle because it's been such a struggle. But if we can do it together, if we're, if we're involving the kids, if we're raising our voices and we're not stopping like that is the work it is so important um there will also be joy and there will also be moments of um you know where, where we where we where we get through it together and yeah i mean we have to hope <laughs> Any, anyone else wanna no okay thank you vicky that was so great and <clears throat> one of the things i want to add to this is um like just we just have to try, <laughs> you know, like we just have to, I mean, if you're an educator who's thinking, gosh, I really want to give ki the kids in my classroom more autonomy, but how do I do it? It's like, just, just try, you know, just one step, just one, you know, or you want a multi multimodal opportunity. It's like, just, just give, give a choice, give the kids a choice. Right. And that involving the kids is so critical. Um, and so the approach that I like to take and, and the mentors that I've found um, throughout my um, journey as an educator really are scientists. So, and this is what I encourage educators as well as parents to do, like parent, um, you know, build those relationships. Like as a scientist, you know, you have a hypothesis, you think like, ooh, this is gonna be great for this kid. Try it, try it it might not actually work. Like, that's the thing. We can't get stuck in thinking like we know the answer, but we can have a hypothesis. We can try it out. We can make observations. We can see how it goes. And we can go back to the drawing board and be like, okay, so this little aspect of that worked, but this other part didn't go so well. I'm gonna, let's try it again with some adjustments, like make some adjustments, try it again, make a new hypothesis. Like, don't give up, keep trying. But when you do have that moment of success and you see that incredible look of satisfaction on that child's face and you've had this incredible moment, um, celebrate it, celebrate it, really take it in, celebrate it, share the news, talk to people about it, tell the story. Um, and I think that that's another p important piece. Um, like Vicki was saying, like we have to do it together. And in that way, we need to lift up those stories of success. Um, 
you know, I imagine Mitch, you know, even in your struggles, there was probably one or two moments where you're like, this really worked. I like, I got, I got to this kid and they really like had this incredible experience and got past this really difficult moment. And like, those are the stories we have to keep telling um, so that people are continue to be encouraged to, um, to, to make those changes, to, to take those steps. Um, I think that that's the only way that we'll, we'll really start getting that the, the attention necessary for people to be willing to step beyond their fears of um, doing something different, right? It is, cause it is an a hundred year old plus year old system um, people are afraid um, to do it differently, but as soon as we start sharing the success of um, of these moments of like that, especially those moments where we've captured this child's creativity and the brilliance, and <laughs> um, and then we're like, wow, and it really worked. <laughs> Actually, they really didn't know. <laughs> um, I think that that um, that's the kind of thing that's gonna. Um, give people the courage to really make those changes. Yeah, thank you, Anna, for that. You know, that was, especially your last point there, I think that really was a great reminder um, about constantly going back to the kids and the relationship building that the Turtle Island crew talked about, so huge. and and doing the things every day that you know intuitively in yourself as an educator, but also as a human being, um, meeting that kid or those kids and doing those very things that, just, that, that you know are gonna be doing good for them no matter what the system dictates. And I think that is something that I'm reminded of that, that really helped me in my practice, even though in the hardest of times is that every single day I just went with those kids in mind. And I mean, I think that's why we're all here for too. So thank you for that reminder that I, I need that too. Um, you know, kids first, kids centered, like that's why we're here. So thank you. That is a, that is, that is, that is a beautiful, beautiful sentiment. And I think that it's also, you know, when you're, when when your own autonomy as a professional, you know, in whatever field you're in, when you, when, when you don't feel you have autonomy for many, for many nervous systems, it is very hard to like be the best at your craft, right? Like, so, so of course you're not going to be able to access like that world rule because you're dysregulated. Um, and that's going to be the case in, in, for, 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 for any professional. And it's that co-regulation or co-dysregulation experience, um, you know, whether that be between, you know, professional and student, but also thinking about like, like just conflicting access needs when you are in an environment where, you know, we all have different access needs, things we need to meaningfully participate in our, in our, in, in our experience. Um, and so, you know, in a, in a, in a, in, a, in a big group, in a big classroom where every student has different needs um, and different things, especially if that student, um, you know, like has the kind of brain that needs to be interested in order to attend and, you know, motor plan and all the things that dopamine does for you, um, then, then that's going to be even, even more complicated. But I would say that, that one of the themes that's jumped out from, from all of you and Missy is that that nature and, and, and you know being being outdoors is can can really support the regulation and co-regulation experiences. Um, can 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 uh, you know we've got about five minutes five minutes left. I'd just love to hear um, uh, for, for for any any wisdom that any of you have about that and how to get more, more outdoor um, uh, education infused, even if you're working within a setting that is not nature-based. Vicki, are you talking or thinking? I'm so, I was asking a question, um, Katrina, and then I was just talking out loud. It's a it's a tough question, but um, my last school was um, very urban, and we we had a parking lot as a as our playground, and um, so a lot of what we did uh, was bring materials into the classroom. You know, I mean, to be honest, 
what is nature? Because everything is built from nature. <laughs> and so I think that question is one I, I ask a lot when we talk about nature based because um because we shouldn't be disconnected from the fact that we all come from nature, that that the building that we're in was built by materials from nature. And so what what are we actually trying to get at? But I think um bringing in materials from the outdoors, you know, loose materials, um, branches, sticks, pine cones, those kinds of things. And then also, you know, just lots of books and songs um, so that we're still learning about the earth and our connection to it. And again, I just think that content piece of where humans come from, where where living things come from, and then where how where everything comes from essentially. So a lot of what, yeah, a lot of what we've done in settings that aren't necessarily outdoors, like we're, we're very lucky to have at Turtle Island is to teach, like if, we, if we're eating a snack, if we're eating it, um, food, we can discover where it came from. We can um, discover how it looked like as a seed and how it looked like as a plant, if it was a plant, who harvested it and what who those people are what what country they live in and then how it traveled from that country to Vermont and how it got to the grocery store and how we got it so just always connecting to the source of things and you can do that in any setting mm -hmm. really and you can show images of people who are laboring on farms in other places in Vermont or in other countries you can show manufacturing images of how things are made but just can always connecting to the source of of things I love that so much, Vicki. And Mel, I love this question. Thank you for asking it. Um, and I have I have um, kind of gone down this rabbit hole quite a bit late in recent, recently, um, specifically in research that shows um, how a connection with nature um, does support uh, regulating the nervous system, can support, um, you know, mitigating ACEs and, um, and giving people and um, children, especially kind of that fresh start, um, where the brain can begin to rebuild those um, critical connections for um, rest and digest and, um, you know, and, and really be, be in that um, learning space. Um, and so for me, there's two things come to mind. One of my first most favorite things like doorways to nature is listening. So no matter what space you're in, taking that time again, like um, just that slowing down and taking that time to say like, what do we hear right now? What do you hear right now? Um, you know, and just giving that, giving enough space and for those little brains to start observing and just slowing down and taking in their surroundings. Um, and then just that doorway of, of all of our senses and how our senses really bring us back into our bodies. Um, one of the other um, exercises I've become really um, fond of and been teaching a lot, I call become a tree. So using movement and using uh, you know, our own body awareness to we can grow our roots down into the ground and, and drink up any moisture or nutrients found deep within the earth into our bodies and feel ourselves soaking in the sun. And, um, you know, that kind of, there's, there is co-regulation between us and nature because we, as we breathe, the trees breathe and that supports us with breathing and the, and, and so like Vicki was saying, the connection, the way that everything is connected is, I think, just that in, intimate con, um, doorway right into nature, no matter where you are. So beautiful. Well, I so appreciate all of you for being here. Um, and I, I, I think you've given all of us so much to, to, to continue to reflect on um, uh, about what's possible in small ways and big ways. Um, because it all, it all really comes down to thinking about the, the, the child at the center, the whole child at the center, not only because they are the future, but because they are the key to the universe right here and right now. 
end. Um, I hope that um, everyone will join us back next week. Um, we'll see what the weather holds up about, about whether, whether it's a hybrid format or, or here on Zoom, but uh, next week we'll be reimagining employment. Um, and uh, reimagining systems of employment uh, so that all brains can thrive. Thank you.